Thank you. Thank you for the beautiful song. I, I wish I could sing Swahili. My wife and I were going to sing a song for you tonight, but uh, we may wait till tomorrow evening to do that because our time is a little dear here right now. But I'd like to invite you to kneel with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come before your throne of grace. We thank you that there is grace sufficient for all of our needs, and I need your grace exceedingly great tonight. And I ask that you will give me a blessing that I need and not disappoint your people, but give them a blessing too, Father, and help us as we continue to study our message. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> If you had a neighbor who was Baptist and he came to you and he said, I'm sorry, I'm not finished. I'm, I'm being rude. Let me finish. You can finish your conversations. I don't want to be rude. Let's say that you had a neighbor who came to you and he was Baptist or she was a Baptist. And she said, really, what's the difference between your church and my church? What would we say? Well, we could say, well, we work on the seventh day Sabbath, and you don't. You could say that that's true. You could say, Well, we believe Jesus is the Son of God, and that's true. But are those things, or maybe even the type of diet we have, you know, we could say, Well, we, we don't eat meat much. Maybe some of us don't eat meat much. Maybe we don't eat any. Some of you may eat a lot. I don't know what your diet is. What is it that separates Seventh-day Adventists from the rest of the world? It's the three angels' message. You know, friends, it's not the Seventh-day Sabbath that makes us unique. There are many other Sabbath-keeping groups. It's not the fact that we believe Jesus is coming soon. Our name Seventh-day Adventists. Most Christians believe Jesus is coming and coming soon. And it's even not that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. There are a lot of other non-Trinitarian groups. But friends, there's no other church under the sun that is preaching the three angels' messages. There's no other church that believes in the message of the investigative judgment, the heavenly sanctuary, the 2300 days. Now, we talked about the first angel's message some, and we did not go through step by step the 2300-day prophecy. We could have taken time and went through the mechanics of that prophecy, taking the 70 weeks, dividing the 69 from the 70th week, continuing on to 1844. And we didn't do that. I would advise you that if you need study on that, I brought some study cards. Um, see whoever's in charge of that literature I brought. But I brought a few hundred study cards. And there might be enough that each family can have one. But it has the graphic of the timeline on it has all the bible text in the back you need to give a bible study on that that's good we're not going to talk about the mark of the beast while i'm here not because it's not worthy of being talked about but i think most of you are pretty well schooled in that but i want to talk tonight and tomorrow morning on the third angel's message concerning the issue of separation and perfection what how they tie into those topics and so this afternoon, we're going to talk about the third angel's message and separation. I'd like to say that God raised up the Advent people to prepare and to perfect the people who would live to share the full gospel. My wife, Sherry, she has a background in what sometimes is called the full gospel movement in America. And that means a type of, of Pentecostal church where they say that they believe in all the gifts. But friends, the full gospel, the real full gospel, teaches all the gospel and nothing but the gospel. It teaches the most primary fundamental thing, and that is that Jesus is the Son of God. And this, this giving of this message, this demonstration, would bring glory to God and vindicate his character to the universe. As the gospel would be given, friends, and as it is be given, there is what I'm going to call a polarization occurring. And it's going to continue to occur until the close of probation. And what that polarization means is, just like if you have a bar magnet, 
and you know you have a north end and you have a south end of the magnet and uh, they they either repulse or, or attract other magnets depending on the polarization this world today as a whole is becoming more corrupt more evil more violent but god is calling out people he's calling people out of babylon into his flock and those people are starting to polarize and they're starting to understand sanctification to the place that their lives are becoming more and more like Christ. Now, we're told that sanctification is the work of a lifetime. But, you know, friends, some of us don't have the same life as others. I thought of my son, Hans, who was 25 years old when he died. He was only 25. But in many ways, his Christian growth, his Christian experience exceeded mine, who was much older. His lifetime was only 25 years, but God and his foreknowledge prepared him in those 25 years for what he needed to be with God in eternity forever. Amen. And if God allows some of us to live to be a more ancient age, maybe we just need it a little longer, right? But whatever time, and I want to assure you this, whatever time you need to be ready for heaven, if you love God and if you care for him, it doesn't matter how sick you become, what disease you get, it doesn't matter what the chance of being in a terrible accident might be, God is going to preserve you until you are ready for heaven. I believe that with all my heart, that he will watch over and keep you. He will not allow not one of his chosen sheep to be lost. The three angels' messages of Revelation 14 are designed to fully accomplish the ripening process into perfection of character within the saints. We had this statement in great controversy. First, beginning by quoting Malachi, says the prophet, Who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and pure them as pure and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness, Malachi chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. And then she says, Those who are living upon the earth, when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above, are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. You see, friends, there's going to come a time when Jesus is going to say the mediation is over. But it's not an arbitrary decree. Now, God in his foreknowledge, he knows the day and the hour of the coming of Christ. Amen. But he also knows the day, the hour, the moment that Jesus will cease interceding in heaven. But it's not because it's a, a set date that he has arbitrarily put on a calendar. It's because he knows that that will be the moment when this polarization between good and evil has been complete. Those who have polarized toward the evil will have polarized so far that they will never ever repent that world this world as a whole will have committed the unpardonable sin the righteous on the other hand they will be sealed with the seal of the living god and they will be so firmly set in the truth that they cannot be moved now there's been some discussion theologically eschatologically on how long what will the close of probation be before Jesus comes? And I've heard people say, well, it's going to be a day. It may be a year. It could be a month. Well, I'm going to say, friends, it doesn't matter how long it is. It's not going to matter how long it is because those people who have been sealed with the seal of God will never, ever sin again. And it doesn't matter what happens to try to induce them to sin. They will never sin again. And they could be tried for a day, a month, a year, and they will never sin again. We read on, continuing in Great Controversy 425, their robes, those who are sealed, their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must conquer in the battle with evil. Can you say amen to that? While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, and we believe that's right now, 
while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away sin among God's people upon the earth. This work is more clearly presented in the messages of Revelation 14. God has a plan. He wants to bring a people to perfection. He wants to bring you, friends, brothers and sisters. He wants you each to be able to stand in his presence and live. He wants you to be happy in heaven. You know, the simplest theology I've ever heard on this. The simplest theology I think I've ever heard on this is that one brother told me one time, he says, you know, Alan, he says, I think God's going to take everybody to heaven. They'll be happy there. Now, think about that for a minute. He says, I think God's going to take everyone to heaven that could be happy there. Do you think the wicked would be happy in heaven? You know, what happens when you got someone who's really wicked and you invite them to come to church? No, I don't want to go there. That's not, that's not where I want to be. Friends, if they want not want to be in a church on earth, they're not going to want to be in the church in heaven. The Apostle Paul, writing in Ephesians 4.13, speaks about prior to this, the giving of gifts, that Christ gave gifts to the church for the purpose, he says, to we all come in the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Now, sisters, Man is representative here of humanity. It includes you too. You get to be involved in this until the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God wills, beloved, that his people become perfect and have a unity of faith. This perfection and unity happens in those who accept and cooperate with the three angels' messages. These believers will be the ones who receive the seal of the living God. However, the people who reject this message, who reject the three angels' messages, are going to accept another gospel. They will be religious, for sure. I think we read a text from Acts about people being too religious, remember? They will worship, for sure. They will worship, though, a false god and a false gospel. Paul says emphatically in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6, he says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. That word another is from the Greek word heteron or heteros, and it means another of a different kind. It's not the true gospel. It's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's another gospel. It's a fake gospel, if you please. This religious claim, this religion claims to offer salvation because it calls itself a gospel. However, one of the great hallmarks of this gospel is that it will deny the power of God to overcome sin. We made reference to this text earlier in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. Having a form of godliness, they profess to have the gospel, but they deny the power thereof. And that Greek word power is from a word dunamis in, in the Greek and in the English. We take that word because of the way it transliterates and we have our English word dynamite from it. It means something that has explosive power. And God has power, friends, to help you to overcome sin. But he says to those who deny it, you should turn away. These people will finally receive, friends, those who deny the power of God, they will finally receive the mark of the beast. Concerning the giving of the three angels' messages, Ellen White wrote these thoughts in the book Early Writings, page 258 and 259. She said, I was shown three steps. How many steps? Three steps. The first, second, and third angel's message. messages. Said my accompanying angel, woe to him who shall move a block or stir a pin of these messages. The true understanding of these messages is of vital importance. The destiny of souls hangs upon the manner in which they are received. Friends, not even a pin, not even a block is to be disturbed from these messages. Continuing, I was, sh I was again brought down through these messages and saw how dearly the people of God had purchased their experience. It had been obtained through much suffering and severe conflict. God had led them along step by step until he placed them upon a what? Solid, immovable, platform now friends that platform doesn't move for us but people have discarded that platform 
people have turned away from that platform and tried to develop and establish a new platform, which fundamentally negates all three angels' messages. In 1844 and shortly thereafter, God desired to lead his people step by step onto a firm platform of truth. But again, this platform of truth to accomplish its goal, there had to be a corresponding experience with Christ that would be firmly grounded. It's like last night, Brother Anthony was speaking about, it's one thing to know the truth, it's another thing to live the truth, right? And so we have to have that experience corresponding to the truth it speaks about. Now, the first angel's message, Ellen White tells us, was for a purpose. It was to separate the church of Christ from the corrupting influences of the world. The second angel's message, again, the spirit of prophecy helps us to see the purpose of this message. It says, as the church has refused to receive the first angel's message, which message? The first angel's message. They rejected the light from heaven and fell from the favor of God. They trusted to their own strength and by opposing the first message, placed themselves where they could not see the light of the second angel's message. But the beloved of God were oppressed i'm sorry but the beloved of god who were oppressed accepted the message babylon has fallen and what did they do left the churches that's a separation when you leave that's a separation the third angel's message and these are from early writings page 249 and through this one is she says, they were not free from errors, and I saw the mercy and goodness of God in sending a warning to the people of the, of the earth and repeated messages to lead them to a diligent searching of heart and study of the scripture, and then continuing, that they might divest themselves of errors which had been handed down from the heathen and papists. And so the third angel's message was to separate people from their errors. So Ellen White noted, when you are baptized with the third angel's message, the purifying truth for this time, you will make, says this will, this time you will make a separation between you and the world. She goes on to say, the third angel's message is infallible. Now one place on White says only God and heaven are infallible. Why would she say the third angel's message is infallible then? Because, friends, it comes from God in heaven. And because it comes from God in heaven, it is infallible. It is to unite a people to do a special work, preparing them with what? Preparing them with what? Perfection of character. Tonight, I don't stand before you very perfect in many ways. I wear these eyeglasses because without them, I can't read anymore. I can't even see your faces clearly. I've got scars on my arms and hands. My body is breaking down. But friends, what I need more than anything else is a perfect character. And I, like Paul, I'll, I'll stand here and be very honest with you today. I will say I've not obtained yet. But friends, like Paul, I will tell you I'm pressing forward. I'm pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. And I want you to press toward that mark also. Amen. This was to prepare them with perfection of character to unite in one great family in the mansions Christ has gone to prepare for those who love him. Well, Brother Sammy, there ain't going to be one place for you and one place for me, is there? Well, we shall be neighbors. You know, I like that idea. I've come to love you folks, and I'm glad I could spend part of that time with you. What do you mean? As we review these statements, these three messages were to bring about a work of separation. The first angel's message was to separate the people from the corrupting influences of the world. The second angel's message was to separate the people from the corrupt churches. And the third angel's message was to separate the people from the corrupting errors that had been around. These messages would result in perfection of character. And friends, God's going to be able to present to the universe those whose lives have been changed by this message, and he's going to be able to proclaim, here is 
the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. Can you say amen to that? Amen. This group, this group, people, you people, you people, our brothers and sisters here in Kenya and Uganda and Ethiopia and South Africa and Zambia and these countries around and all of Africa and the world, this group will have the genuine faith of Jesus and will live above the corruption of both world and the corruption of the churches. This group, the Bible says, will have the Father's name written in their foreheads. They are partakers of the new covenant experience. And God says, I will put my law in their inward heart, in the inward parts, and write in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. He says that in Jeremiah 31 in verse 33. Now let's look at the verses that precede the three angels' messages. Because, you know, in Revelation chapter 13, when you come down to verse 18 there, you come to the end of that, that section, and then you jump, it seemingly the, 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 the movie jumps, if you please. You know, it's like you're coming to a new scene altogether. And John says, and I looked, Revelation 14, 1, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of great of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Do you remember we read a couple of statements about the 144,000, how they will be in perfect square, perfect order. And they have the father's name in their forehead. It goes on to say, and they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne. And before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. That that is an amazing thought. Now I don't think it says when when it, when it says no one can learn it, that no one can know the chords or what the words are. But you know these songs. When you read about these songs in the Bible, they are songs of experiences. We stand and we sing, oh, redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, right? But friends, if we haven't really been redeemed by Jesus Christ, we're singing a lie, right? I love to tell the story. Do we really love to tell? If I don't really love to tell a story, I'm lying when I sing that. Think about it, friends. Here's going to be a group of people. They're going to be singing about an experience they had, and it's true. And I can't sing. If I'm not a part of that group, I can't sing about that song because that song won't be my experience. My experience will be different. But their experience will be unique. Their experience will be very unique indeed. And then this one, verse 5, verses 4 and 5, it says, For they are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Besides having the Father's name written in their foreheads, Jesus sees as recorded in verses 4 and 5 a description of the specific character traits of the 144,000, and specifically we have a description of the character of the 144,000 that they received from accepting the three angels' messages. The first characteristic is, it says that they are virgins, not defiled with women. Now, we know that in the Bible, a woman represents in prophecy, symbolically, a church. And there are two types of women portrayed in the book of Revelation. There is the, the, the beautiful woman of Revelation 12, and then there is the harlot of Revelation 17. And they're very different women, aren't they? And they represent God's true church, and they represent the corrupt church. In Revelation 17, 2 and 18, 9, God condemns the church for having an unlawful relationship with the kings of the earth, using them to either support her or protect her good name or prosecute those who are considered to be heretics or dissidents. Friends, to be loyal to Christ and a church not following Christ is impossible. Did you get that? You cannot be loyal to Christ and loyal to a church not following Christ. 
if you are loyal to a church not following Christ, then you, I'm sorry, if you are loyal to a church not following Christ, you cannot be loyal to Jesus Christ. Not, not at all. Now, in verse 5, it says there that, that in their mouth was found no guile. The Greek word we translate guile is dolos, which means bait or deceit. It's, it's, it's a Greek expression. It, it literally means fish bait. You know, if you're trying to catch fish, if you have a hook and you put some bait or something on it, and you're lowered in the water and the fish thinks it's getting something good, right? But really it's meeting its end. And he says, these people, they don't have that in their mouths. And you know what that tells me? For the same, that tells me there's not going to be a Trinitarian one among 144,000 because there's nothing more guiling than the Trinitarian doctrine. These people have given up all false doctrines, including errors about God, his character, errors concerning about righteousness by faith, errors about God's government and purposes for humanity. The 144,000 have made a decision to give up every known sin and to follow Jesus whithersoever he goes. And yet today, friends, there they may still have character defects, but God is revealing those character defects step by step, one by one to those people so that those character defects can be eliminated so that within whatever our lifetime is, we may truly be sanctified and ready through the power of Christ to be overcomers. Step by step, he's leading us along. God leads his people on step by step. We're told in Testimonies, Volume 1, 187. He brings them up to different points calculated to manifest what is in the heart. Some endure at one point, but fall off at another. In other words, friends, when things happen, and sometimes things just go haywire, God is allowing events to happen in our lives so that our characters can be perfected. If everything was easy, if there was never a trial, if there was never a difficulty, friends, our characters couldn't get perfected. She goes on to say, on every advanced point, the heart is tested and tried a little closer. If the professed people of God find their hearts opposed to this straight work, it should convince them that they have a work to do to overcome if they would not be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. Said the angel, God will bring his work closer and closer to test and prove every one of his people. That's you, my sister. That's you, my sister. That's you, my sister. That's you, my brother. Every one of us. He's going to bring the work closer and closer to you, to me, to prove his people. Some are willing to receive one point, but when God brings them to another testing point, they shrink from it and stand back because that it finds directly, it, it strikes directly at some cherished idol. Continuing. Here, they have opportunity to see what is in their hearts that shuts out Jesus. In other words, friends, God's going to reveal to you what, what you need to know. He's going to reveal to you where you're not right. The question is, will you listen? Will you listen to that still, small voice? They prize something higher than the truth, and their hearts are not prepared to receive Jesus. Individuals are tested and proved a length of time to see if they will sacrifice their idols and heed the counsel of the true witness. Continuing. And if any will not be purified through obeying the truth, how are we purified? By obeying the truth. If any will not be purified through obeying the truth and overcome their selfishness, their pride and evil passions, the angels of God had the charge they are joined into their idols, let them alone. Remember what, what, what the prophet said about Ephraim. He's joined into his idols, let him alone. Well, the angels will do the same thing for us, friends, if we have our cherished little idols. 
and they pass on to their work, leaving these with their simple traits unsubdued to the control of evil angels. Those who come up to every point and stand every test and overcome, be the price what it may, have heeded the counsel of the true witness, and they will receive the latter rain and thus be fitted for translation. Beloved, if we cherish sin, if we cherish one sin, if we cling to any false doctrine, if we refuse to be separated from any character defect, we will not be prepared for the time ahead, and we will positively, for sure, accept the mark of the beast rather than die. But the testimony about God's people at that time is found in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. It comes down to this very simply, friends. We need to come to the place in our experience where we would rather die than sin. We would rather die than sin. Today, in the corporate, the big Seventh-day Adventist church, by its lack of the true spirit of Christ, by its false teaching, such as the Trinity, by its refusal to separate from the world, is preparing its people. It is preparing its people step by step to receive the mark of the beast in their foreheads and in their hands. Jesus said, of course, we know the text, that we are sanctified by the truth. Thy word is truth. That's what we need. The serious nature of the truth will not be overlooked intellectually or experientially by the 144,000. However, friends, no matter what the profession, if we reject part of the message or do not allow it to work in our hearts, we can, you know, Ellen White says there'll be many who preach the Sabbath that will be saved. Did you know that? She says there'll be many who preach the Sabbath and they won't be saved. Because, friends, they didn't get it in their heart. They may have known all the Bible texts. They could have been able to stand before a congregation with their Bible alone and open and say, read this, read this, read this. And they could have made a very seemingly convincing presentation and they will be lost because they have not allowed it to work in their hearts. And they will at last accept the mark of the beast. We've been told in the great controversy on page 608, as the storm approaches, the little offshoot groups Does it say the little offshoot groups? A large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified to obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. I want you to notice something, friends. Do you see this word? What is it? Right here. Position. Do you see this word position? What do you think that means in its context? It doesn't say they change their church. It doesn't say they leave the church. They change their position. What is the what is the position they're changing? It's what they believe and profess. And they join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose what? The easy, popular side. The three angels' messages, friends, will prepare people to stand in the presence of a holy God and sin defiles, and sin defiles, and it will de be destroyed at the end of the great controversy. Those who cling to their sins will finally be destroyed with their sins. All who will be finally separated from sin, either by choice, one way or the other, we're going to leave them behind now, and we'll be with God in glory. Or we're going to hold on to them and be burned up with them and be separated that way. We have a choice. We've been told, for instance, in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Tonight, God is telling us to choose life, to choose life. The work of the Holy Spirit, we are told, is to convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. The world can only be warned by seeing those who believe the truth sanctified through the truth, acting upon high and holy principles, showing in a high, elevated sense 
the line of demarcation between those who keep the commandments of God and those who trample them under their feet. In other words, friends, we can preach it, but what the world has to see more than hearing it preached, they have to see it preached in the way we live it, in the way it has changed our lives and made us different. Before I close, and we just have a few minutes left tonight, I just want to share a few more thoughts from inspiration for your consideration. First, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we read some of these verses recently, but I want to read them again. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? For what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? You probably have known of some seemingly really good Christian girl who got attached to a boy that wasn't a Christian. And, and, and she fell in love with this young boy and she wanted to marry him. And no matter what counsel you gave, you just couldn't change your mind. And it could be the other way around. But friends, I, in, in those situations, I'm sorry to say, I have to question just how good of a Christian girl that is. Because friends, a good Christian girl does not ally herself with an infidel or with an unbeliever. And a good Christian man will not ally himself, ally, align himself with an unbeliever. It doesn't happen. Two, won't, two do not walk together unless they're equally yoked. What concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? The implied answer is we don't have a part with them. Our work is to change them from infidels to believers. Yes, but friends, you don't do that by bearing. Young people, please listen to me. You don't convert someone by marrying them. And you don't convert someone by dating them. Don't get that idea either. Verses, verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And then continuing in the chapter to, to the end there. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. In Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 13, after quoting these very verses that we just read, these are the conditions upon which we may be acknowledged as the sons of God, separation from the world and renunciation of those things which delude and fascinate and ensnare. I think it's starting to rain outside and people are concerned they probably have laundry out and things, I understand. But try to listen if you can stay. The Apostle Paul declares that it is impossible for the children of God to unite with worldlings. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. This does not refer to marriage alone. That means it refers to marriage, but not to marriage alone. Any intimate relation of confidence and co-partnership with those who have no love for God or the truth is a snare. Friends, don't even enter into a business arrangement with an unbeliever. Don't do that. I had a brother a few years ago. He was telling me about this arrangement he was going to make. He, he, was, a, he was a financer and, and he, was a, um, he was very skilled at, at organizing things. And he was going to start this construction company with this unbeliever who had all the tools and training to build houses and, and had crews that could build houses. And together, they were going to make a lot of money. And I said, you know, this guy, you say he's not a believer. He's not even a professed Christian, let alone Seventh-day Adventist, right? He said, yes. He says, but he told me that he won't work on Saturday. He told me that we won't have to do anything on Saturday that's okay with him. I said, I don't care what he says. It won't work. And don't get involved. But he got involved. It didn't work. He lost a ton of money and got into a lot of trouble from it. Friends, you can't go against God's word and think you're going to be successful. In Testimonies, Volume 4, on page 109, the first 30 years of Christ's life were passed in retirement. Ministering angels waited upon the Lord of life as he walked side by side with the peasants and laborers among the hills of Nazareth, unrecognized and unhonored. These noble examples should teach us to avoid evil influences and to shun the society of those who do not live aright. 
We should not flatter ourselves that we are too strong for any such influences to affect us, but we should in humility guard ourselves from what? From danger, from danger. Ancient Israel were especially directed by God to be and remain a people separate from all nations. They were not to be subjected to witnessing the idolatry of those about them, lest their own hearts should be corrupted, lest familiarity with the ungodly practices should make them appear less wicked in their eyes. And you know that's true, friends. The more you're around evil, please listen to this, consider it. The more you're around evil, the less evil it appears. The more you become familiar with the evil, the less it will appear to you. Few realize their own weakness and that the natural sinfulness of the human heart too often paralyzes their noblest endeavors. Oh, Lord, I'm going to do right. I'm going to do right. I know this girl's not a Christian, but I'm going to marry her. And I'm going to give her Bible studies. And I'm going to take her to church. And before you long, you find out that she's getting him to read the wrong things. And she's taking him to the movies. Yeah. That's it. And so, friends, how is it with us tonight? I've went over my time, or do I have three more minutes? Three more minutes. Okay. The three angels' messages, again, it is a separating message. It wants to separate us from the world. It wants to separate us from the corrupt churches. It wants to separate us from the errors of those churches and the errors of the world. Will you allow them to do that? God wants you to be a holy people, a peculiar people. And when Jesus comes back, friends, he's going to come back as a flame of fire to the wicked. The Bible says that the wicked will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. And if we have not separated from sin, if we are still holding on to sin, we will be destroyed with that sin when he comes back. How is it with you tonight? How is it with you tonight, friends? You know, you can fool me. You can fool Zadok probably. You can fool someone else. And you might think you can fool the whole church. But if things aren't right, and you know things are not right, you cannot, you will not fool God. Tonight, friends, you stand at the judgment bar of God. Do you really have Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, as your advocate, to mediate for you at this time? If it's your desire to have Jesus in your heart, to have him as your mediator, please kneel with me or bow your heads as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful tonight for the blessings of the three angels' messages. They are so important to us. They are so vital to us. And yet we ignore them at times, and we ignore them at the peril of our own soul, our eternal life. Father, you are preparing a people right now through the ministry of Christ to stand perfect and holy in your sight without a mediator. And those people are going to stand holy in heaven just as much as they've stood holy on earth. And if we haven't stood holy in earth, Father, we won't be able to stand in heaven. So please prepare us. Please bring us step by step, point by point, with trials and troubles and tribulations if necessary. Father, lay us upon our back if need be that we might look up and look to heaven and seek the help that we need tonight. Father, there must be a soul in this meeting tonight that is, is trembling under the weight of sin. Please, Father, help them to understand tonight that they can turn their sin over to Jesus. They can surrender their pride, their ambition, whatever it may be, to the Savior. And he will not only forgive them, but he will cleanse them from all unrighteousness. Oh, Father, speak to the heart of that individual or individuals tonight. Be close to them, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And I would like to say, as Brother Anthony said earlier, if you'd like to talk to me about any of these things I've preached on or anything else, find me. I will have time for you. We will make time. If you need to talk about the plan of salvation, if you feel like tonight 
if tonight you feel like that you weren't prepared, you're not prepared to meet Jesus. If he was to come tonight, or if you were to die tonight, you don't know that you would be ready for heaven. Come talk to me. Come see me, please. See one of these other men. They will help you. That's what we are here for. And thank you. Good night and God bless.